I was a bit hesitant to accept the invitation at first because I've not been working on ethics for a while. Um, uh, at least that's what I thought. And then it occurred to me that actually we have been engaging in something that is uh, quite relevant to this kind of discussion uh, at Leiden University, largely in response to developments uh, taking place um, uh, in the international field, but also in the institution itself, uh, around data management. Uh, that's something I'd like to uh, raise <coughs> as, uh, I think, a possibly new development in the field of research ethics. Um, uh, and, and I think I feel I should try to contextualize that a little bit and then read to you at least part, if time allows, part of a statement that I drew up uh, as uh, together with my colleagues um, in a committee that was meant to, to, to investigate uh, the position of uh, our institute, the uh, Institute of Cultural Anthropology and Development Sociology, uh, in relation to questions for so-called <coughs> data management plans, as they've been called recently. <coughs> Uh, but I should backtrack a little and, 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 and tell you a little more about you know, my position vis-a-vis -vis ethics, uh, anthropological ethics in particular. I'm definitely talking from my own discipline uh, and especially from the ethnographic research relationship. Um, uh, also, obviously, from uh, this uh, developing country called the Netherlands. Uh, where we don't have ethical institutional review boards or research ethic committees. Uh, uh, although that doesn't mean that we're unaffected by <coughs> Anglo-American developments. That's certainly something that we have to reckon with. And that's partly also my, that was part of my response to it initially. When first asked to reflect on ethics in anthropology, uh, you could say that my first response was, yes, we've, if, if once we do ethics, we have become too ethical already. Uh, and uh, the, the, the first reaction I had was based in my own training uh, as an anthropologist, where very often the argument was that epistemology is the primary problem that we need to address. And if there's any ethics, then it follows from that, rather than isolating <coughs> ethics as a separate problem and thereby reifying uh, it in a way. Uh, it's particularly through the work of Johannes Fabian that uh, the supervisor, uh, 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 that, that, I, that I learned the argument that it is in itself irresponsible to prior prioritize ethics and method over epistemology. Uh, if you define epistemology as the empirical study of what, how we know, right? So, so some of some of the things that Ron and Adam addressed are are indeed also in that sphere. What actually do we do? How should one study ethics um, uh, uh, as an epistemological problem? In a way, uh, is already there. And one of the answers that I also often got is uh, we we know by the grace of social. Uh, cultural relationships that we strike up during research, right? Our knowledge is based on in a social relationship, and uh, I, I was particularly struck by the notion of grace uh, since uh, more recently I read uh, a beautiful introduction to a special issue of the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute on uh, hospitality by Matt Candea and, uh, and Giovanni de Cole, where they argue that grace you know, which, which obviously is, is a concept we don't know except from the anthropology of religion, uh, that grace is something that is crucial to hospitality uh, because it is a kind of, you know, invitation without an immediate uh, expectation of, 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 a, of a reward, um, right? That, that, uh, and I sort of think that that very well matches uh, the research relationship of, of ethnography. Uh, in many cases. Um, the other inspiration that I use is, was that of Charles Taylor, uh, where he taught me that ethics, uh, in fact, uh, might limit morality to an arbitrary number of values. Uh, so, and again, that's, that's something I think uh, 
particularly Ron's uh, uh, distinction of research ethics and research governance brings out. That there, there are, there are, there's a much wider field of values uh, that might be obscured if we concentrate on ethics as a single uh, point of attention. But the answer to the question, have we become too ethical, uh, might also be negative in the sense that um, if ethics had been reified, uh, compartmentalized, and essentialized by the use of the term, uh, not least by the institutionalization of ethical codes, which have that effect, I think. Um, it is also quite important to realize that this institutionalization itself, uh, and again, Adam has already pointed to that, um, uh, has its own history. Uh, it's something that changes over time. And one of the dangers of using the word ethics uh, uh, in what you might call uh, a reified fashion is that we think it means the same uh, throughout its career. And, and it, I think if you think of research in terms of social relationships, then it's obvious it is not. It doesn't mean the same thing uh, over time. Um, in anthropology, at least, the first ethical codes were drawn up uh, uh, modeled uh, on the professions, right, on law and medicine, uh, with the idea that an ethical code would be an instrument uh, that, uh, that could uh, uh, help to discipline uh, those members of the profession that went out of line uh, by means of peer review. It was actually part of a professionalizing uh, 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 background, uh, although when it was adopted in anthropology, and I'm thinking particularly here of the adoption of the principles of professional responsibility by, by the American Anthropological Association in 1971, when it was adopted, it was actually more of a political move against fellow members of the profession than it had to do anything with disciplining uh, individual, uh, um, uh, individual practitioners. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the story, uh, the uh, ethical code of the AAA was adopted uh, in the wake of the discovery of anthropologists having worked for the CIA in uh, Cambodia and, and Vietnam, and the Project Camelot in Latin America, both uh, massive counterinsurgency programs uh, paid for by the United States government. Uh, and Margaret Mead, who was the chair of the AAA at the time resigned over the fact that other members of the profession said we need an ethical code to prevent this kind of thing from happening. And that's why not only the first, um, uh, f first statement, the first, first point in the ethical code is that uh, the, the, the anthropologist's paramount concern should be the interest of the people studied, but also that it is forbidden to do secret and clandestine research. Uh, which is the, the, a clause that's been dropped since uh, by the revision of the code in the 1980s uh, under the influence of, uh, actually, I think, to some extent, justified under the influence of anthropologists working for uh, commercial uh, firms, right? Whose paramount interest is obviously not the people studied, but the firm itself. Um, One of, the, one of the effects of this professional model, uh, as I argued in a, in a, in a paper I wrote in a, in published in 1999, is that it ignores the moral engagements of anthropologists that happened before codes were introduced. Uh, and that, I think, is, is an important thing to realize. You, it, it's, it's been fashionable for a while to, to actually regard the anthropologists who were working, say, in colonial circumstances as uh, as, uh, in a sense, irresponsible or evil because they were working in colonial circumstances. Well, if you actually look, in, look into many of the arguments that they used, there were people, maybe to some extent like, uh, like those anthropologists who were working uh, with the CIA, who thought that this was a good thing and that it could actually be, um, uh, be justified. So whether they were right or not, there were moral arguments there, uh, but there were also moral arguments against them. And of course, there's this famous uh, discussion in British anthropology in particular about the extent to which uh, anthropologists were kind of, you could say, flawed 
uh, uh, flawed protesters against colonial relationships, uh, uh, working with colonial governments despite the fact that they didn't really agree with many of the things they did. Um, that's, that's part of my background uh, uh, in ethics. And one of the things that struck me, and this is uh, very much in line with, um, with Ron's uh, distinction of, of research ethics and research governance, and very much in line with Adam's warnings against uh, uh, the institutionalization of ethics uh, through uh, RECs or, or IRBs, uh, it struck me that we can also we ethics in a postmodern situation has come to mean something quite different. Uh, different in the sense that in sociological terms, it's part of a deprofessionalizing phase. Uh, deprofessionalization in the sense in which sociologists talk about professionals becoming less and less independent. Um, the IRB, as Adam just showed, I guess, uh, the IRB is characterized by the fact that it increases the control of the employer, of the researcher. Uh, it increases the control of the university through institutionalizing ethics. Uh, that's actually the opposite of increasing the self-control of the profession through institutionalizing ethics uh, in, in an, uh, an independent association through a code. Right? That's the original legal and medical model. I'm not saying that the original legal and medical model was ever, you know, applied uh, in the way it was meant to. And I'm, I'm talking about the, here about the ideal, and it might well be that some of my arguments don't really work uh, because I'm talking from an ideal rather than from a practice that I should uh, frankly say I've never studied. So, <coughs> Anyway, um, I think therefore that it's quite important to see this shift in the social basis of ethics that took place when they moved from being an ethical code of a professional association into being an instrument of an institution uh, in relation to disciplining its employees. Um, right, so the mechanisms of what has been called audit culture, and is one of the reasons why I published the paper uh, in the book called Audit Culture, edited by Melanie Sinthone, on ethics, uh, that these mechanisms, uh, to some extent, um, uh, that privilege social relationships external to the profession and its core resource, uh, research relationships. And this is again where one could say research ethics should actually start with uh, those re social relationships, uh, and particularly with obviously the social relationship with research. Um, and it's important to nuance this, this, this <laughs> argument uh, because, in a way, again, if you look at anthropologists who are working for uh, commercial firms, um, the introduction of uh, uh, an institutional review board or a research ethics committee for them might actually be an improvement of the situation as compared to the relative independence that researchers uh, used to. Uh, used to uh, enjoy at a university, right? It, uh, in, in a situation where there's no codification at all, uh, the introduction of codification might actually be a step forward. Um, so that's, again, maybe a call for context, uh, as we've already heard several times uh, from the previous <coughs> speakers. Um, this, is, this is the context in which, that, which makes me worry about uh, a possible third phase in the shift in meaning of the notion of ethics uh, under the influence of uh, the reification and essentialization of the notion of data. Uh, I think one, one, of the, one of the reification effects is visible in the fact that few people seem to realize that data is the plural of uh, a Latin word. Uh, <laughs> right? uh, they, 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 they really seem to know that. Um, my students don't in any case. <coughs> Um, concretely, I, we were asked why not only the dean of the faculty but also the university board itself to draw up a position regarding the need for data management plans in every piece of research. 
um, which was partly a response to a similar demand by the European Research Council, uh, which I think is still in the works. I'm not completely sure because I, I haven't engaged in uh, an application recently myself. Uh, but it is clear that the idea of drawing a data management plan for each uh, application, each grant application, is also uh, something that's in the air. Uh, more particularly, the university and the faculty are so keen on this because they feel that an explicit position regarding the accessibility of data to other people is necessary in the context of suspicions of scientific fraud which is one of the hot issues uh, in Holland at least, uh, uh, partly because of a few scandals that have happened recently. Uh, but also, I think, uh, and here again, maybe the scandal isn't the, the actual cause, uh, very much so of, uh, because of a, uh, a growing suspicion of the elite status of scientists and universities uh, and the sort of a neoliberal climate that says these guys have to pay have to make their pay, you know, worth our while. <coughs> it has to be useful what they do. Um, <coughs> one thing that particularly worries me there, but at the same time I find very exciting as a research topic, is that this emphasis on data management seems to bring, how to put this, uh, this, this is to some extent the new part of what I was trying to say, and I'm not sure that I have the right words here. Uh, but it, I think it brings the notion of property into ethics, into research ethics. Uh, data are things you can actually have. So the question becomes, who has the data? Who has access to the data? Where are they stored? Who can control that storage? Uh, uh, who has right to those data? <coughs> And this is where uh, we felt, as a group of uh, ethnographers, uh, that uh, it was it was very important to uh, to draw a statement that 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 showed our own position. Uh, what we tried to do was uh, compose a committee with as many you know representatives of as many different uh, research strands as we could think of within the small orbit of our small institute so including a visual ethnographer who would deal with film uh, film has its own extremely complex set of ethical issues uh, obviously somebody who was an expert on uh, digital social relationships uh, and especially uh, of course concerning uh, the now rather painful issues of storage of digital data now that you know that the NSA has access to them. Um, and um, we, we work with actual ethnographers, uh, but also people who work with large quantitative sets and data sets. So we try to bring that all together. Um, and we came up, uh, interesting enough, with, with, with a set of discussions that everybody uh, found really exciting and I feel take a position, uh, and I tried to use the rest of my time to, to read you a little bit from that position paper, uh, to take a position that I feel is both um, in tune with uh, the kind of critical anthropology that I come from, uh, and that I also associate with, uh, for instance, the work of Johannes Fabian, not him alone, obviously, but uh, he, is, he has been a very important influence on me. Um, uh, but that also is, in a way, conservative to the extent that it tries to reflect what, well, ethnographers of my generation do. Right with their data, what what is the common practice? Which is basically nothing, right? We we gather them, <laughs> we put them in a box, and then we keep them in a room, uh, where happily most people don't have easy access, so we don't have to worry about these these data. So in that sense, it's conservative, maybe even a little bit irresponsible what we've been trying to do. Uh, and, and and I'd love to discuss that particular issue with you as well. This is not a statement meant to make people do something different, right? This is a statement meant to reflect what I think most of my colleagues uh, and myself uh, are doing. 
So I'll read you from uh, Data Management for Anthropologists and Ethnographers, a position paper of the Institute of Cultural Anthropology and Development Sociology, which we were asked to draw up by the university board, right? Because they, luckily, uh, they didn't want to impose a model on us, but they wanted us to tell them what our standards were. Leiden is good in that way, by the way. It's, it's a real professor, professorial university in that sense, which doesn't mean it escapes all the hazards of neoliberalism because of that. Uh, from the first comprehensive codification of ethics in anthropology onwards, and here's the reference to the principles of professional responsibility of the AAA, anthropologists and ethnographers felt primarily responsible in their management of data towards the people they study. Ethnographers recognize that social research is necessarily based in social relationships and therefore has to be built on a qualitative, intersubjective and value-laden foundation, usually based on mutual trust. Ethnographers therefore acknowledge that all social scientific data are co-produced. This is the core word of the whole statement. Right? Ethnographers therefore acknowledge that all social scientific data are co-produced by researchers and researched. The co-production of data implies that data are rarely fully owned uh, by either researchers or research. The first duty towards science of anthropologists and ethnographers is therefore to recognize this joint pr production and joint ownership of data. All forms and norms of managing data depend on it. Um, the reference in this sentence towards duty to science is an explicit reference to certain codes of conduct that are present in our environment. Among them, uh, uh, the general code for scientific conduct drawn up by the uh, Association for, of, of Dutch Universities, uh, which is supposed to be valid for all disciplines, uh, which incidentally, when it was first drawn up, made ethnography illegal or uh, <laughs> uh, they've, they've modified it a little bit since then. By adding a clause, this is not meant to uh, just to be applied, but it could also be used as a form of critique. Uh, right, so as, as a guideline, it's, uh, this, this, this wonderful phrase that is meant to uh, actually um, uh, take the sting out of the code, I think, uh, in a way. Uh, anyway, the, this, this, the, the, one of the phrases in such codes is that it is one has a duty to science, and very often what follows on that phrase is that one has the duty to share data with other scientists, right? Among other things, to, to, to prevent fraud or to make it possible to check somebody, whether somebody has actually done the research. Uh, uh, the other obvious reference here is the one that is in the first clause of the, uh, the principles of professional responsibility of the AAA, which says that our first and paramount responsibility is towards the people studied. And our committee was faced with this dilemma, how can you be a researcher, a scientific researcher, and have two of those potentially contradictory principles? So uh, that's why at a certain point when we continued the discussion, we realized, listen, if the first responsibility of a scientific researcher is to gather data together with the people studied, uh, then there can't be a contradiction between the interests of the people studied, or not, not a necessary contradiction between the interests of the people studied and the interests of science, right? because they come together in that same relationship, hence <coughs> this choice of a point of departure. Um, uh, I should add, actually, that the, this, this is the first time that I present this argument to an audience like this, so we are very, very keen on your response, uh, what you think of this, whether it's feasible, whether we can actually you know, manage this to work, to make this work. Uh, so I'll continue the statement. Um, the collaborative nature of ethnographic research highlights several complexities of social research in general. <laughs> The recording of data, whether in written, oral, or visual form, is a form of collaboration to which participants have given their consent during fieldwork, including conditions pertaining to analysis and publication. That last clause is really crucial. I don't think your responsibility as an ethnographer ever stops, right? 
after you've gathered data. I mean, you, you, you may be out of the field, but you're not out of the social relationship with the people in the field. That, that is a historical fact that you sort of carry along. Um, researchers should continue to treat data as collaborative for as long as they work with this material. Although the degree of involvement of research participants in the analysis and publication of data is variable, these two aspects of the scientific process are commonly understood as the prerogative of the ethnographer. Here's sort of the conservative part of the thing, right? I, I didn't want to have to reorganize my social life uh, just, just because of this statement. Yet this prerogative comes with both epistemological, methodological, and ethical implications. This is where you see my concern with uh, the avoiding the reification of ethics back. Right? It's, it's, I think the, the whole issue is, and that's, that is the way I teach this to, to my, uh, especially um, MA students uh, who, are, who are going to do actual ethnographic research, uh, uh, I, I try to teach them that that this is basically um, uh, an in, indivisible uh, set of concerns, and ethics is part of method, just as method is part of ethics. Uh, if we divorce the two, we do something wrong in teaching uh, what what kind of research we do. <coughs> right. I have to cut the reading of the statement short, uh, which is not a really bad thing because. Uh, uh, there's a lot of repetition in it. Um, but I'd like to, uh, 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 to mention uh, a few implications uh, already addressed. Uh, the first implication, to epistemological, mythological, and ethical implication. The first implication has already been mentioned. Data are fully owned neither by the researcher nor by the people researched. And this implies that... Uh, you know, even in the case, for instance, of observation, where you could say I'm a researcher in a public space, uh, where uh, you know I'm I'm not actually beholden to do anything in particular or to, to 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 cease from doing anything in particular. Even then, you still have to ask the question: To what extent do the people that I've actually observed uh, are? To what extent are they affected by by what I do? With interviewing, making films. Etc. You're most obviously in a collaborative situation because somebody has to cooperate, uh, and this is where some of the arguments that Adam also referred to may uh, may be relevant. Because one of my colleagues um, uh, was very impressed by the argument that you know there is already a form of informed consent in the fact that somebody consents to be interviewed or somebody consents to be filmed. That doesn't mean that. Uh, even if it's not explicitly uh, signed in advance, it doesn't mean that there is no uh, consent there, and that doesn't that it doesn't give responsibilities to the to the researcher. The second implication is that the individual researcher can and should be held responsible for the integrity, preservation, and protection of the data gathered during a specific research project like any other caretaker of collective property or disciplinary standards. Thirdly, the third implication, and here I quote again from the AAA statement of 2012, researchers have an ethical responsibility to take precautions that raw data and collected materials will not be used for unauthorized ends. Unquote. The individual researcher therefore has a duty to subordinate the sharing of data with third parties, including other scientists, also in cases of investigating fraud, to the recognition of the collaborative date, nature of data. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up here uh, by, by sort of saying that, of course, this was partly our response to a specific situation, and we insisted with the board that they carefully distinguished the uh, issue of fraud, of scientific fraud, which is a concern, uh, right? There's this, in this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, awful case of a social psychologist who's actually made up uh, uh, his data uh, and became a full professor through it, uh, who's, who's now uh, fired from the university. And I was myself a member of a committee that investigated the work of a Dutch anthropologist who uh, we suspect, because we couldn't prove it since the data were not accessible, they, were, they, they have been destroyed, according to this. this uh, 
anthropologist, but he was suspected of making up uh, his fieldwork data uh, in both, uh, in, in two different countries. Um, so th we insisted on making that distinction and to remain um, uh, to, 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 to place, as it were, the ethical confidence and the plans for managing data on the actual epistemological situation uh, that one finds in research. And I think we formulate, we try to formulate that in the idea that data are collectively owned or at least co-produced and in that sense uh, uh, they carry an ethical responsibility. This is not a legal responsibility. It's a very important distinction here. Uh, an ethical responsibility to regard them as collectively owned. Um, and uh, this to me, and this is the last point I'd like to make, this to me it brings also the, uh, up, brings up the idea that, that we may be entering a different situation because if now our, the institutions that employ researchers are trying to zoom in on the things they actually produce on the basis of their research work, um, the uh, argument will more increase, increasingly be that they actually own these data. And, and this is what we are trying to prevent with this statement. Uh, we're trying to say uh, to our university board, you don't own these data. If anybody owns them, it's the researcher and the people research. Uh, that in itself, of course, is already based on maybe a reification, not only of the notion of data, right, which, which, which sort of takes the product of our research out of the actual process in which, the social process in which we, we do the, this research. Uh, but it might also uh, uh, run the risk, therefore, of, of, of encouraging that, uh, that focus on something you can actually own. Um, and that, to some extent, worries me for the near future uh, as something to look out for.